Thank you for joining us again for our continued discussion on the road to recovery. In part three of our discussion, we'll cover the changes that we've made during COVID-19 from side of care to telemedicine and their lasting impacts coming out of the pandemic. Join us to continue the dialogue is Dr. Hanjo Kim, Dr. David Aconquo, Dr. Nitin Khanna, and Dr. Bobby Kalantar. Gentlemen, thanks again for joining us. Let's start with Dr. Aconquo. David? There have been so many technologies that have been introduced over the last several years that may have been done for different reasons, but under this current set of circumstances, they are magnificent options for us to get better. And if you look at the way that information is being spread, over the last 10 years, there has been this huge shift in the, in the world of publishing towards these online open access journals. Well, it turns out that those have been the journals that have been the primary conduit for this rapid publication of data that's coming out in real time out of China and Asia, and then subsequently in the Western Hemisphere, for us to be able to participate in real time in the growing of this understanding. So that, that effort over the last 10 years, which was motivated by trying to maintain profitability in a modern era for information dissemination that has historically be do been done through print journals was a fabulous foundation for this moment to be leveraged for us to have rapid communication in a global pandemic. Likewise, all these technologies that have been built for telemedicine, which were largely constructed for other reasons, are now fantastic opportunities for us to leverage in this current situation and it's amazing how rapidly there has been a switch from the face-to-face -face clinic appointment to the telemedicine visit. And the percent of telemedicine visits that are happening in medicine right now is astounding. If you look at, at rates of today versus rates of six months ago. And that was put in place because of several companies putting out a huge effort to build these technologies for different reasons. Uh, in the years leading up to, to 2020. Likewise, ambulatory surgery centers have been constructed across the country, by and large, for different motivations than preparation for a global pandemic. And yet, here we are with a massive amount of capacity in the United States of America to shift carefully selected operative cases from the hospital setting into the ambulatory surgery setting. So this is, this is a great thing. And this is, this is the beauty of our country and the fact that we have so many people with so many different skill sets and so many different talents applying themselves in all of these different ways that we're leveraging all of those years of effort to be in a position to then say, we're gonna capture these opportunities and convert them into something that is going to be of meaning and value to, again, real patients with real problems in the United States who need care for these conditions that are affecting their quality of life. Nitin, you've long been a proponent of the role of the ASCs in spine care. Aside from an environment that improves reimbursement, what are the considerations that are critical for surgeons to think about as they consider the appropriate role of ASCs as a place of care for their patients? Well, again, just to, um... I like to just echo David's comments. I think that this is clearly a transformative moment, and it really is incumbent upon um, the, the thought leaders, uh, both from the orthopedic and the neurosurgery side, to be able to build the new normal and build best practice. To, to David's previous point on telehealth, I think it's going to be transformative. When we talk about an efficient healthcare system, if a patient is doing well or is checking in to follow up on an MRI, to have the patient spend however much time driving to the office, finding parking, coming and waiting in a waiting room to see a busy doctor for five minutes, I think that value can be delivered over a telehealth visit for seven minutes or maybe even for three minutes. But since the patient didn't have to leave their comfort of their environment, the, their perceived value is gonna be much higher than jumping through all the hoops of showing up you know, face to face and, 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 and going through some of these more um, trivial uh, uh, office visits. And so I think that's going to be a huge, you know, uh, 
um, game changer in terms of keeping volumes down in the office and, and being able to maintain social distance and also driving efficiency and convenience for patients. Um, on the ASC side, I think this is really the moment where all these years of um, building up what an ASC's possibilities are, are really going to come to light. The main focuses of the ASC are the opportunity for physicians to really have control over process. They can drive patient safety and drive value to the system overall. And I think these are all attainable goals utilizing these, this ASC model. I think with um, and anybody who's been at Spine, uh, David's out there long enough like me, you know, we're kind of uh, old enough to know what open spine surgery was and we probably did a lot of it in our training. I mean, I certainly did. Um, there was a transition from open surgery towards minimally invasive surgery. And the big holdup was really, you know, surgeons coming with a comment, that's, that's the way I do surgery. And I think that this moment is an opportunity to really change that. I think this COVID era is really going to bring forward meaningful change, both inside of service as well as a further drive towards more minimally invasive procedures, because um, I think both David and I would agree patients don't want to be in the hospital for four and five days. And I think the data on minimally invasive spine surgery and outpatient surgery has really shown lower infection rates, lower length of stays, and increased patient satisfaction in study after study. Thanks, Nitin. Bobby, love to hear your thoughts as well on what changes will remain permanent through this crisis. From a telemedicine standpoint, you know, I think one of the hurdles was uh, essentially some of the HIPAA uh, regulations around it and some of the um, issues with payment from insurance companies. And those are the things that were waived in this uh, very early period to allow continued access. And so I think as, as a medical uh, society, uh, we have to uh, lobby to, to keep some of those changes permanent. And I think it'll, it's much easier to do so now where we have some real benefits uh, that we can point to to, to allow people to continue to access their primary uh, physicians as well as their specialists. Uh, and so that's, I think, one thing that I think we, we need to push for from a lasting standpoint. Um, the, the other um, aspect is really related to uh, ASCs, which we talked about. Um, we, we, you know, have been trying uh, in spine surgery to push in that direction for a long time. There's been a lot of research about safety of uh, certain procedures that have traditionally been done in a hospital setting and how we're not seeing higher complication rates when done in ASCs. And in fact, um, you know, sometimes in some of the research is showing lower uh, complication rates. And I think sometimes it takes a um, collapse of the system and, and a rebuild to to finally break through to some of the detractors as well as some of the legal hurdles that have been in place uh, against ASCs and, and then specialty hospitals uh, in general, which have um, some good evidence that they uh, have lower hospital stays and, and the, uh, increased satisfaction. And I think this is a good opportunity to push that forward because that patient population, healthy enough to be in an ASC environment really is going to be the first phase or two of a return to some amount of elective surgery, which really buoys the, the medical system financially, you know, uh, as far as uh, our health system goes in MedStar, um, you know, they really need uh, us to get back in a safe way uh, to, to continue to support the, the system itself. Um, I, I think there are some great advantages uh, from a technology standpoint, um, a colleague of mine was showing something that the physical therapists have been working on. They're doing a fair amount of telehealth and they're incorporating AI technology to help, um, you know, ascertain how a person is using or, or placing their arm in space or their leg in space to really get a more accurate range of motion that could be done remotely instead of with a, with a, a direct physical exam. And a lot of, uh, uh, you know, Silicon Valley companies are, are looking into uh, this kind of technology. And I think it, this is uh, something that in the coming couple of years can really take off and really change how we do a lot of our, uh, our health care. Um, and uh, I, I think there's some really big positives that we all kind of felt were coming anyway, but maybe in little pieces and in, in years to come. 
that might explode onto the scene that we can take advantage of and maybe improve a very inefficient system, which is generally medicine. It's, it's, it's inefficient in a lot of different ways with all the players involved. Um, you know, I think when we have time to come up for air, it'd be good to, to have that discussion at a, at a society level uh, in spine societies to really coordinate that effort uh, jointly. Uh, I think there's some advantages that we can take it uh, into the future. Hanjo, as we close out this topic and discussion, we've seen positives come out of this experience as it relates to transformation. What is your perspective on this topic? What are the catalysts that will help change our industry for the better? The transition to the increased utilization of telehealth, I think, is one of those catalysts that um, might have happened two or three years from now, but because of this situation has been um, hastened and, and we are now uh, forced to utilize it. Uh, some of the tweaks and the uh, bugs in the system have been progressively being, have been progressively worked out in the last few uh, weeks as, as we've been doing uh, telehealth visits for follow-ups. And, you know, I, I echo uh, Bobby's comments that, some of these follow-up visits now could probably be performed with telehealth visits, save patients the, the traffic. Um, it'll decrease the need for things like uh, LPNs on our floors to room the patients. It's going to change healthcare as far as uh, where the resources are going to be allocated because of some of the efficiencies that will happen from, from telehealth. Um, something that will happen at my hospital that I think is a little unique is that as we are going back to a return to new normal phase, there's a plan from the hospital to go to 120 or 125 or maybe even 150 percent of capacity um, as uh, the coronavirus cases start to in increasingly dwindle down. Um, we will take our operative schedule to catch up, uh, not only from Monday through Friday, but also from uh, on Saturday and Sunday as well. So. There's going to be a, a basically seven-day surgical schedule going on uh, on the, in that phase whenever that happens. I mean, it's probably not going to be until at least uh, the summertime, mid-summertime. But at, when that point happens, I think um, it's, good, it's going to be a little interesting to see how all of that plays out, uh, how people would time their visits, their practices with their patients, uh, because they'll probably still schedule a day off on on Tuesday or Wednesday or something in the middle of the week with the plan that they're they're kind of operating through the weekend. So, you know, I think the HSS uh, has the ability to do that. I'm not sure how many other general hospitals uh, will do that, but I think some um, uh, ambulatory, ambulatory surgery centers could probably utilize that strategy. And, and the thing about Ambulatory surgery centers is that I think the problem is even if you were to open it up to, for elective cases right now or or two weeks from now, the difficulty is trying to get patients out of their house. And and I, I and I don't believe that even if you were to open an ASC and you were to promise the patient, you know what, you know, you're gonna have zero exposure. There's there are no COVID patients in the ASC. The difficulty is getting patients actually out of their house when there's a active shelter in place order. So I think those are some of the challenges that we have. Gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for participating in our discussion on the road to recovery. This has been extremely informative for our listeners and for myself. Uh, be safe, stay healthy. On behalf of the Invasive team around the globe, we look forward to coming days and weeks and months ahead as we get back to helping transform spine surgery together and caring for patients. Thank you.